In this video, we're going to look at the wall paintings of Pompeii. I already showed you some uh, wall paintings from Nero's Golden House in a, on a previous lecture, um, but I told you to wait until we got to Pompeii for us to really seriously go through this. The reason being, quite frankly, is that Pompeii, as you know, got covered over in 79 AD, and a lot of wall paintings are preserved. And indeed, this wall painting I show you here was just discovered recently, um, and uh, was in the New York Times, etc. And uh, I'll come back and talk about it a little bit later on. But I want to uh, give a background to this before we, we, get, we get to this specific fresco. Now, it's important to keep in mind that uh, people lived in apartment blocks, uh, insula in the singular, insula in the uh, plural. Um, and so they had a lot of uh, uh, party walls, that is to say, uh, walls um, beside their apartments or beside their houses, um, uh, so they couldn't have windows a lot of times. Okay, now these buildings here do have windows, of course, but there's a lot of other walls um, that don't. Um, so, you know, with all these, these closed-in walls, uh, wall paintings can help bring um, you know, depth to the room and make it feel larger. Uh, 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 there's this, this sort of um, uh, claustrophobic effect of walls with no decorations. Now, there are four styles of wall paintings. These were developed in the 19th century. Um, they're helpful in general, but you shouldn't read too much into them. Uh, the chronological significance is uncertain with them, um, and, but they, they, and they don't explain every fresco by far, but they do give us a way to sort of categorize them and how to think about them. It was originally thought that they represent chronological uh, development, uh, but there's you know, so, some uh, conflict with that. They might do so broadly, but not, you, know, you can't say so with every one. Now, the first style is um, uh, style one, um, it, it just uh, duplicates masonry. So you see these uh, squares here of different colors. Those are basically trying to represent you know, different colored marbles or some stone. Um, you know, the ones on the upper level with the semicircular uh, arches through them um, are trying to show uh, veins um, in, um, in the marble or in the gypsum or alabaster. Uh, so it represents reality. Notice right below them is the cornice of a building, um, as if we were looking, you know, at a building. But keep in mind that's two-dimensional there, although it does have a good effect of, of making it look like it is a, a, above a built structure. So the style one represents masonry. Here's another example of it. Um, once again, these monochrome colors, uh, a monochrome for each of the... Um, you know, little panels here. This is a uh, style two at uh, Bosco Real. Um, and here I show you uh, this, this room, just to give you an idea of how these paintings work. So we see this window here, uh, but notice all around it, there's paintings um, as if to be windows themselves, as if you're looking out at onto um, a scenic view of the city around you. Also notice with this bed here and this footstool, there are mosaics on the ground. Um, and I will have a, a video about mosaics uh, soon after this one. So we see here in the second style, it's illusionism. Um, it tries to trick your eye into thinking that things are three-dimensional. And so we look out here at this you know, circular colonnaded structure. Uh, we look through um, col Corinthian columns. Um, and it's, it's as if we are looking out at a building. Uh, it's, um, there's a bit of linear perspective that's used, it's, which is usually um, uh, saved for Renaissance art, um, but the artists are using this as well. Once again, trying to make it as if you're looking out a window. Uh, here are some other examples from there. Uh, uh, you notice on the left, uh, beside the, the real window, is a little... Um, a uh, uh, still life of a glass bowl with fruit in it. And then we see these um, temples, and uh, on the right we see some other temples as well. Notice that on the top building there, the, um, it goes off in the distance, not perfectly. Uh, so the, 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 this you know, linear perspective that's usually preserved for uh, the Renaissance, as to say, to make it look completely three-dimensional, you know, they're not perfect at. 
and some of the roofs on, on these or that ladder um, you know, don't work exactly right, but they try. Notice that there's, they like to put theater mats over top of these as well. And finally, I want to point out the red paint. There is a, we'll see a lot of red paint as we go through these. Um, and it's so brilliantly red that because of these excavations, there is a type of color red called Pompeian red. It's blood red. Um, uh, and so if you go to a paint store, you know, and you look at a color book, there's, you know, that will be an option for you. Uh, and this was very popular at Pompeii. Well, I'm going to show you uh, one example um, in the, you know, uh, at, at the end of this slideshow. Uh, uh, uses a lot of red paint, um, and red was a, a, a brilliant color. Interestingly, and you know, quite attractive. Interestingly enough, it um, it uh, comes from um, from this little uh, conch uh, uh, animal, um, you know, a, a, a mollusk which has a little organ in it that has this blood red dye. But it takes, you know, tens of thousands of these conches to make us, you know, a good amount of dye. I have a friend that actually studies seashells from antiquity, and he has studied some of these rooms and it, where they make these dive manufacturing places, where they make this red dye, and they're just chock-a-block full, you know, many, many feet of deep of just these conch shells. Um, so we'll see that again. Uh, here's another example of um, where the, the temple goes off into the distance. We see just the door columns here the, the, with the little um, uh, theater mask uh, of, of a tragedy on the left, the peacock standing in front of it. But notice once again that it goes off in the distance fairly well, but not perfectly. These were painted rather quickly, so um, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the third style is... Um, sort of less uh, 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 complex um, and is very ornamental um, uh, where, where it's shown a lot of um, just, you know, th uh, thin lines and, you know, to show sort of the finesse of the painter. And also the feeling that, you know, to get away from the very ornamental style of the second style. We see now another example of this um, in the Bosco, in, in the Bosco Tricasi uh, structure here, um, where you see these pencil thin columns coming off a balustrade that is this low knee-high wall um, and then it, these thin 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 columns come up and then it's solid black and then in the middle is just a little bucolic scene usually a scene from um, um, you know somewhere in the woods etc and this is a style that we saw being used at Nero's golden house now the fourth style is um, sort of a mixture of styles one and two, uh, which sort of um, you know makes it sort of the garbage bin of you know of of styles when you don't know what else to do, you put it in style four, where you can see it's like style three with these large monochrome areas, but um, uh, it's a bit more ornamental and larger um, uh, 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 pictures on the inside of these areas and a, and the return to um, a little bit of architecture. Here's another example from style four. Uh, this one painted as if you're looking from a stage, which a, with a stage curtain on top, um, and then looking out into the, uh, a series of buildings going back and back and back uh, to show depth. Now there are a lot of um, uh, uh, just genre styles or genre, I should say, subjects. Um, in these paintings, um, which are hard to put into a style. Some people would say there's uh, style too. In any case, I'm not too concerned about that with these ones. But notice once again the painted uh, fence on the bottom there. That's not a real fence. That's painted onto the bottom as if you were standing on a porch. And we get the story of the Venus on a half shell because the goddess Aphrodite in Greek, Venus in Latin, uh, was born from the sea. This is a subject that will be carried on to this very day. Um, and it's done fairly well, although her left leg, or sorry, her right leg comes up behind her left um, in a sort of awkward way. It, it sort of bends to, in a too rubbery of a fashion. But she, she uh, has this billowing cloak behind her that, goes, that, that frames her quite well. And she lies uh, as a reclining nude, wearing just a necklace and anklets and little cupids surrounding her. Um, another one tells the story of a, of, of a scene from uh, the Aeneid, 
uh, we've, which I talked about uh, with the Augustan period. Uh, there's a story where Aeneas uh, has to be healed by the doctor Yapix, and this shows it um, as the doctor is working on his leg. He puts his hand to his head in pain. Uh, um, his son Anchises cries for him, and he's under his arm. Uh, and then Venus, his mother, looks on, uh, topless and framed by this billowing cloak. Um, and then some soldiers uh, to the behind and to the right of Aeneas. Now, this was a, such a famous story that um, everybody would recognize this. There's, no, for example, there's no names uh, put in there to tell us who it is. Um, so this is a good example of having to know the sort of mythology and history of the culture in order to understand the art. But notice that the ground line recesses back on the feet, at the feet level, um, and so it gives us good depth. And also shows even shadows, so we get the light origin coming from the left on this subject. Uh, so these are very, very good paintings. This is an interesting one. It's from the House of the Gladiator, which is called that because it had many gladiator uh, depictions in it. Some houses, we know the real name of them, some we don't, and they just get named after the, what's painted in them. There was a gladiator part of, of, of Pompeii, uh, and I'll come back to that when I get back to that first uh, uh, fresco I showed you. Uh, and uh, there is an amphitheater there, and this shows a scene um, of, we know from historical records, of a riot in the amphitheater, and people fighting in the amphitheater and outside of it. Now, in order to show that, we have to be able to look into the amphitheater. So it's it, the rounded part of it is sort of brought up and awkwardly tilted towards us. Above it is the vellum. That's this uh, cloth that covers over the stadium and gives shade to the people because they had to go to the you know to these amphitheaters in the day. They didn't go at night. And then we in the front we see the arcade with two stairwells uh, leading leading up and over it. Once again, the perspective gets a little bit mixed and isn't handled perfectly. But we know of the event of this, to which this refers, and that's quite interesting. We get another landscape here. This is the Bay of Naples. I'm um, showing the ports and the harbor and the boats within um, and the columns around the bay with statues on top of it. And so we get a fairly realistic um, uh, uh, landscape here. And so these are, uh, this is one style that was, uh, you know, these landscapes were one thing that's quite interesting in these Pompeian paintings. Here's another genre style where we get uh, um, people reading uh, or readers. Um, they pose with a stylus to their lips. That is something that would cut into wax that would be put into a triptych or diptych, um, which we talked about with the Uluburu shipwrecks. And I'll show you those in a I'll show you how that works in a moment. But they're holding these uh, things that are equivalent to books, although they didn't have books like we have. Uh, they had these uh, triptych diptyches, and then they had scrolls. Um, but notice that they hold the stylus to their lip, which is a style that continues to this day. Um, and uh, on the right side, the man holds a you know a scroll to his chin as well, um, all depicting that you know these people wanted to be shown as learned people as readers. Uh, you know, they have their portraits done in the way they want, right? I mean, you know, they, they pay the painters to paint what they want, and this is how they wanted themselves to be shown, sort of like Facebook. You know, you choose your pictures, and these people wanted to, to be shown um, in this manner. Uh, it's interesting, the one on the left, you can see the woman's hair, she has actually a little cap on of, it seems to be gold interlaced wire, um, and, then, um, and then gold earrings. Uh, so she seems to be wealthy as well. Uh, this is how these uh, uh, how a triptych would work, where uh, you would um, put you put wax inside the recess of the wood and then write a message on it. And when you're all done, you could just rub it away and write something else. Uh, this is a house of the Vedi, um, which I'll come back to uh, when we talk about um, uh, mosaics as well. But here we see a great example of these painted window windows in the center. Even though they change subjects dramatically, it does look like we're looking outside. Um, and um, to the right and left of them are interesting uh, paintings, which are scenes from uh, uh, plays and mythology. The one on the right is the final scene of a Euripides play called The Bacchae. 
The one on the left is an interesting story, and it's a good one to discuss uh, art, historical, art historical techniques. And it concerns the birth of Heracles or Hercules. Now you can see the as a child, he is in the pretty much in the center of the of the painting here. And he has two serpents wrapping around his arms. Um, there are two people to the right of him. That's his father, Amphitryon. Um, well, it's not his father, he th thinks it is. And then Alcmene, his wife. Uh, and then there's a servant to the left. And you can see the three people around them are frightened and they're gasping. The reason is that um, these the reason is this. Alcmene uh, was seduced by Zeus, who came in the form of Amphitryon. Um, uh, Zeus was a, 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 you know, a, a philanderer. Um, and uh, he um, sleeps with Alcmene, and she has uh, Heracles as a child, or Hercules. When Hera, Zeus's wife, finds out about this, she uh, sends two serpents to kill him. But since he's half god, he can kill him himself. Notice Amphitryon is surprised and puts his hands to his chin of why is it that my son can kill these serpents? Um, his wife Alcmene is running away but looking back because the cat's out of the bag. She is going to be busted for you know sleeping with Zeus. Um, and so this is the precise moment where this happens. Um, and notice behind Heracles is a little altar there that has a Roman eagle. And then behind that is a window looking out onto a temple. But this is all painting. And so we get the first story, the first level, right in front of us. And then this window puts a background to it. Um, and it's a really good example of, of how to you know, in, interpret these um, pieces of art. Notice that the servant and Amphitryon, their staffs point at Heracles, so making you look at him. And the eyes of his father and mother look at him. So it draws our eyes to the center of this painting. Uh, and uh, if you know the mythology, uh, you understand the story. Uh, there's also nice depth done here with Amphitryon's left foot coming off the footstool here, leaning forward, surprised that his son is killing these serpents. So that's a fun painting. Now we'll go to a, 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 a very a, a famous painting in this building called the Villa of the Mysteries. Uh, once again, this is painted because of the uh, painting in it. Now, th it's not uh, a, a, a building like we saw before. This is a villa out in the country, a very large estate. Here's the plan of it for very rich people. And this is the very famous painting inside of it, probably the most famous painting from the site. And it has a red background, this deep Pompeian red. And then we have this wall, this balustrade that goes around. It's a painted wall. Uh, and then pillars come off that wall as if we're looking out onto a real vent. Now here we see that the painting turns the corners of the walls. Now I want you to pay attention to um, uh, the guy on the center right who's reclining against um, a, 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 a woman, actually. Um, over her lap. This is Dionysus, um, and he has a thyrsus across his lap, um, and he's always shown, you know, in, uh, um, uh, with no hair, uh, 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 clean shaven, as it were. We believe that this is the woman in the white on the left is perhaps uh, the matron of the house. Uh, and then there's a lot of figures dancing around and spinning around. Here we can see a um, uh, uh, Dionysus in the center there, and there's a satyr to the left of him playing a cymbal, um, and the scene to his left or right, I'll come back to in a moment. But I want to show you this um, uh, 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 this young girl here reading um, something from a papyrus scroll. The interpretation is we think it's probably a, a marriage ceremony or a, an engagement ceremony. And the child uh, reads, um, you know, the, the the agreement to the marriage, perhaps, or some other religious object. Uh, now here we see um, on the right a satyr, you know, a naked man dancing around, and this would have happened at the parties for um, uh, for Dionysus. Uh, notice on the left there is. Um, a woman in the back holding a thyrsus. She's a menad. 
uh, in front of her is a naked woman with two little um, like castanets that she's holding one in each hand spinning around, which is shown from the billowing of her cape there. And we know that those were used in the, um, in the ceremonies uh, of Dionysus, the Bacchanalians. Now here's another perspective from that corner. And what's sort of bizarre here is that this young girl has uh, had her back exposed and she lays across the lap of an older woman. And, two, uh, and behind her and on a different wall is a woman with wings and she holds a twitch, that is to say a little stick, and she's whipping the woman. Um, and then to the left of that woman with wings is uh, another woman who's opening a basket, lifting a cloth off a basket, and it's thought to be that she is um, lifting a phallus out of it. Um, and so when the people who found this uh, site, you know, a long time ago, found these wall paintings, they called it the Villa of the Mysteries because there were mystery religions in the ancient world, religions that, um, uh, that, you, that you couldn't know the, 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 the rights behind it unless you were initiated into them. Uh, there were several of them. But this seems, you know, unlikely for this because we saw Dionysus um, in the scene, um, and uh, so therefore it's some sort of bacchanalia. Um, but at the same time, there's a myth of, you know, a marriage ritual. It's an obscure myth, but nevertheless out there, that young girls, when they got engaged, uh, would, or young women, I should say, would walk through the streets and, they, and, and the older women would have branches that they would hit them with. Um, perhaps that's what's going on here. And as we return back to Dionysus, we had another shot there. We can see the woman with the basket. Um, and then Dionysus again, you can see the Thyrsus across his lap. It's a bit clearer in this one. And the people partying all around them. I do want to say that um, there has been some recent discoveries at Pompeii. Uh, here's one that was recently found. This was just announced about a month ago. Uh, it shows the myth of uh, Leda and the swan. Um, for some reason, Zeus comes to the woman Leda in the shape of a swan, and they mate. You know, who knows why? It's just an obscure thing, but um, it's a very popular myth. But look at all the, the ash over top of it and how this conservator cleans off the ash from it, and the colors are so brilliant and well-preserved. And then this one was recently found, too, uh, this gladiator here. Um, the one on the right is uh, bleeding out of his uh, chest and out of his arm there. The guy on the left is victorious. And the guy on the right is basically um, asking for forgiveness. And he's holding his thumb up, right? And in order to say, he wins, okay? I give up. Now, there are various types of, uh, of uh, gladiators, you know, many, many types. Um, and here we see uh, uh, some battles here. Uh, the guys on the in the center, or the second from the left on the top, has a shield uh, and then a big uh, 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 net hanging over him. The guy to the right has fallen in battle, and we can see the blood all around him. There were judges at the gladiator events to make sure that everything was fair. On the bottom, once again, we see that one of these fighters who has a net, um, and usually it's a net and a trident, but here uh, we don't see the trident, and the man to the right uh, has this large spear, and the judge looks on. Gladiatorial events were very popular uh, in Roman art. They would frequently show um, many, um, they would have many battles going on at once on the Colosseum floor. Music would be played. Uh, uh, it was, you know, quite exciting. Once again, we see the judge on the far right. Oh, and to, his, uh, to the left of him, this guy saying, I won. Look, he points his fingers up as if he's arguing with him. Uh, here's another uh, painting. None of these are Pompeii, except that first one I showed you. Um, this is a bit later, but um, it shows these men fighting. One man has even fallen, or a couple guys have fallen, and there, uh, one's laying on his shield to the left. Uh, the one on the right is about to be killed, as we can see. Now here we go back to, the, um, to this new painting. You can see the blood dripping out of his chest and his arm. And so they're still making spectacular finds at Pompeii. Uh, and these are some interesting ones. Uh, um, uh, and there's more to dig there. We'll, uh, we'll keep on learning. OK, in the next uh, video, I'll talk about the mosaics that have been found uh, at Pompeii and elsewhere.